Okay, so welcome everybody to today's teacher professional learning session. Can I fall down the cracks? Plate tectonics misconceptions. So this is the first part of a two part series we will be running. Uh, so my name is Louise and you can see Lara as well. We're in the same room as each other. So we'll be taking turns to talk today. And later today, we'll also introduce you Oh, Ron's there, he's got his video on. Ron wants to give us a wave. So Ron is our resident scientist for today and we will be speaking a little bit more with Ron towards the end of the session. Okay, well, let's get started. So before we start today, we would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which we virtually meet today and pay our respects to the elders past and present. We would also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us for today's session. So this is the plan for today. We're gonna to start off with a short introduction to Geoscience Australia and our education program. We're gonna have a quick chat about why it's important to talk about misconceptions. We're gonna run through four common misconceptions that we encounter in the education center. We'll then open the floor to questions. So we will be taking questions in the chat at this stage, and we will be taking those over to Dr. Ron Hackney at the end. So we'll ask you for your questions and then while you're typing them in the chat, we're going to run through the classroom resources before we finish up with running your questions past Dr. Ron. So I'm going to hand over to Lara now. So Geoscience Australia is Australia's national geological survey and we provide geographical and geological information for the nation. And we're situated in Canberra, there are about 600 of us in this building here. So Louise and I work for the education program here at Geoscience Australia. We have our own dedicated room and you can see in the top left hand corner there is the bread and butter of what we do, seeing students in person. And it's a picture of a student there pouring sediment into the columns. We have these columns, every school visit that comes puts a layer in and that's our, our visitor book, if you like, the record of their visits. Top right hand corner is a bigger picture of the education centre itself and underneath that bench is actually a time scale two scale at 4.6 metres long. Bottom right is an example of some of the benches we have with samples of rocks that the students can pick up and touch and interact with. And bottom left there is an example of all the education resources that we spend our spare time doing that you can download off our website. Okay, so we said at the beginning that we're going to be talking about some misconceptions. So to start us off today, we wanted to show you just a short video that shows some people addressing misconceptions they have about science. So I'm just going to flip across to YouTube for this one. So just have a watch of this. When you touch an object and it feels warm or cold, what is that really telling you about the object? Here I have a metal hard drive and a book. And I'm gonna ask people to compare their temperatures. Which one do you think will feel warmer, the book or the hard drive? The temperatures. Yeah, tell me if one is hotter or colder or if they're the same temperature. How do they feel? Uh, this is slightly cooler than this one. Yeah. Oh, that's warmer. Yeah, way warmer. Yeah, agreed. I'd say the hard drive is a lot colder than the book. Um, I don't know, because the book's got more knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? Metal's normally a little bit chillier if you leave it in a colder temperature. Well, what if I said that they're both at the same temperature? What would you say? I'll tell you you're lying. <laughs> but really? I think you're lying, yeah. Um. Okay, so as I bring us back to our PowerPoint, I want you to just have a little bit of a think about some of the attitudes that we saw expressed there. When people were told that their conceptions or their beliefs about what they were experiencing were actually contradictory to the science. So you noticed at the end of that video, we had people, when they're told that maybe they're they had a misconception, they said, you're lying. So it can be actually quite hard to change these attitudes. So the difference with this video to what we do is that the second part of the video shows the presenter demonstrating to them that the objects are actually the same temperature using a thermometer. But when we're talking about plate tectonics with our students, it can be much more difficult to prove these misconceptions wrong because plate tectonics happen on very big scales and they happen over very long time scales. So it's hard to demonstrate to our students. Just give our slides to change. Okay, so we have here a 
study that was basically done into misconceptions in science. In this case, it was in physics, uh, but they found that having a misconception can actually give students a false sense of knowing, which means they don't invest in their learning and can interfere with memories that would give them new understandings of this science. However, the study found that if you expose students to misconceptions, so told them that this is a misconception rather than just trying to teach over the top of it, that you can help them overcome these difficulties and learn a new concept. Let's have a look at our first misconception. Now we see a lot of students from grade six up through to year nine, and this is commonly said by many, many, many of the students, even in year nine. So this little girl is saying, we can't see the tectonic plates, they're under the ground. Uh, it's really interesting if you, if you ask the students, have you seen the tectonic plates? Have you touched them? Have you been inside them in the sense of being under the ground inside them? They say no. And if you say, okay, look outside the window and look at the big flat thing that we commonly call the ground, you're looking at the top of our tectonic plate, they can get quite stunned. Uh, if there are students rarely who will say that, yes, they have seen the tectonic plates, if I can get that to move on, then what you find is that they're not actually saying the right thing. They're, they're saying that the plate boundaries are the tectonic plates, or they're saying the mountains are places where you can see the tectonic plates. So this here is a, is a list of the three things we generally find are the misconceptions in their heads. So I'm going to change to a different camera for a sec. That. Okay, so this is one of the pieces that we have in the Education Centre, it's just bought from a, a common online supplier. It's just a globe of the earth, but you can actually take out a segment. And if you take out a segment, it allows you to show the layers of the earth. So you can see on the top, the, the four usual layers we talk about, we've got the crust, we've got the mantle through here, we've got the outer core, and the inner core is stuck, still stuck inside there. And if you then ask the students, if you can't see the tectonic plates, where are they? There isn't really an answer because clearly the tectonic plates must be part of these layers that are shown here. And clearly, of course, then you can also see these land masses and, and the ocean floor on the top. So that's one way of doing it. Just switch back to the other camera. Has that worked? So the other way to do it is to actually think about the Earth in terms of how it formed. So if you think about the Earth and how it originally formed, it of course started off as a big molten ball and all the heavy material through gravity all sank into the middle and all the lighter stuff, as I've heard it spoken of by scientists, the scum of the Earth rose to the surface. And then over time it would have cooled down and would have cracked into giant pieces and then those pieces would have thickened at the edges and then started to sink. And if you use that story, there's no way that the, the students can come to the misconception that tectonic plates aren't the outside of the Earth. Whoopsie, now it's working. Here's a really nice diagram. Now, Dr. Ron has made it very clear, I must make it emphasize that the, the diagram, although it's a nice diagram, does have the crust much, much thicker than it is in real life. So the crust in this image is shown in the brown. So again, I'm gonna switch cameras for a second. Okay, so here's a really easy thing you can try in the classroom. If we shrink the Earth down to about 1.2 metres in diameter, then the crust is half a millimetre. And so if you think about that, there's no way that you can really depict 1.2 metres and half a millimetre in a book or on a, on a web page, which is, of course, why these diagrams are the way they are. But this is a good way of describing it. If you then add a description of how big the lithosphere is, we're going to come to that in a second, the lithosphere would be three centimetres in this 1.2 metre diameter Earth. Back. So if we then go back to this diagram, what you've got there is the split of the crust and then the very top part of the mantle. 
in the gray there. And that very top part of the mantle, we call the lithospheric mantle, it's a bit of a tongue twister. That bit there is the same in its physical properties as the crust above it. And you can see that they've both got rigid written in brackets there. And those two things combined, the crust and that top part of the mantle, the lithospheric mantle, make the lithosphere itself. Then under that, you've got the, the plastic layer. You can see it's written there as the next layer down in the tan color. And then we can actually see the other layers being described there as rigid and liquid. So this is a nice diagram in the sense that down the left hand side, it talks about the Earth's layers as classified by chemical composition and on the right side by their physical properties in the brackets there. This diagram comes from an article from Nature Geoscience published in part by our, some, some of our scientists here at Geoscience Australia, it was published last year. And what you can see is the global lithospheric thickness. If you look at the second part of the legend or the key at the bottom there, it has lithospheric thickness in the scale running from red through white into the blue. And it shows that it can be anywhere from sort of below 50 up to 300 and possibly beyond. The nice bit, and I think the cursor is there at the moment, you can see that dark red bit through the Atlantic is showing that that must be much thinner lithosphere where we've got a divergent plate boundary. And we'll come back to that a bit later. And then if you look at the Western part of Australia, it's a darker blue where we've got very, very thick lithosphere uh, down into the 200, uh, up towards 300 kilometers depth where we've got some original protonic material. Next slide. All right, this little blondie is saying the mantle is made of liquid rock. Hmm, but is it really? We regularly use the word liquid. I think we, it, it rolls off the tongue very well. It's very much published when we, we look at the material on this sort of stuff. Um, but the, the image that comes to your mind when you think of liquid really is more about that sloppy stuff that's in volcanic craters, particularly that video of the, the new Icelandic volcano that's going off at the moment. The better way to think about it is it being more like a glacier. So a glacier is a really good analogy. So glaciers are solid ice, but they move downhill under gravity. So you can think of this as something called solid state movement or the flow of a very, very, very viscous fluid. So the ice is flowing because individual crystals are deforming and recrystallizing, and they're changing their shape in response to the pull exerted by gravity. If enough grains are deformed and recrystallizing, then the final result is actually a slow downhill creep. So on a human time scale, it looks solid, just like in this picture, but it's fluid on much, much longer time scales. So there's a really nice glacier simulator that you can use within a browser from that link that's there on the right. Uh, and you can then change various uh, bits and pieces down the bottom. So things like the sea level air temperature, you can then set it going and you can see the time down in the gray bar. It says 51 years and you can see it moving over time. And the little bear at the very top there, if you drag him along, you can follow that glacier as it steadily creeps along. The other nice thing about this is that in the right hand green box, you can create graphs and, and do a little bit of maths. So that's quite a nice example. Another one is what I've called world's most famous experiment. It's nice that it's an Australian experiment. So this is an experiment at the University of Queensland. It was started in 1927. The fellow in the picture is Professor John Mainston and that picture was taken in 1990. So this is the pitch drop experiment. You may have heard of this before. Uh, it took from 1927 until 1938, so 11 years for the very first drop to drop. So minute to minute, it looks solid. And then now and then a drop forms enough that it actually does, does drop and you can actually see that dropping. The right hand side picture there, you've, you can see that somebody's got a hammer and taken the same material and hit it. And so that uh, is subjecting it to that sudden external stress has, has caused it to shatter. So that very high strain rate on there. And again, this is another example of the properties that the mantle material has. So here's a think pair share. I know you may not necessarily be with somebody you can share with, but just have a think about this. It says, how does mantle material move up to make mid-Atlantic ocean ridges at a divergent plate boundary? And there's a diagram to give you an idea of what it is we're talking about. Move to the next slide. Here's a nice short video of oceanic crust being formed. So what we're going to see here is video taken at the ocean floor of new basaltic rock coming out. It looks like it's being 
pushed out like toothpaste and it clearly does look fluid because you can see it flowing there and moving out making new oceanic crust at a divergent plate boundary so the way to think about it is to go back to your states of matter and this is something that you can do so this is more of a year nine level perhaps and beyond but states of matter is much earlier if you think of a gas and you increase the pressure or you reduce the temperature, then you can make the particles closer together. You can form a liquid. If you then uh, put more pressure and cool it even further, you get a solid. And of course, then the reverse is possible as well. If you're thinking about a tectonic plate, uh, divergent plate boundary, you've got your lithospheric material moving away from each other. You then take the pressure off the material that's below. And so you are now taking the pressure off, going from a solid to a liquid without a temperature change. The material is now liquid and more buoyant and can actually start to well up. So the answer there, decompression melting. If you wanted to try an experiment that does a, solid, a state change, it goes from a liquid to a gas at room temperature, you can try this video here from the Exploratorium, which is a US science museum, where you can boil water in a syringe and you pull back the barrel on the syringe with the water and you're reducing the pressure and you can make the water boil. I won't play that for you though, you can try that later. Uh, another example you might be familiar with is Mount St. Helens. Here's a lovely picture, series of pictures from the USGS. There was a landslide in 1980. It took material off the part of the mountain and that reduced the pressure on the stuff that was laying underneath. That pressure then meant that the gases that were dissolved could then explosively expand and that blew off half the side of the mountain, which you can see on the far right there. Many of us might actually have studied this in the past or remember its uh, anniversary from last year. Some modern day examples that we can see on the landscape, we've got the African Great Rift Valley there. So that's the, those beautiful giraffes standing there so elegantly in front of a volcano. So that's where we've actually got the loss of continental material um, above the mantle that is then creating volcanism. And then the picture on the right hand side, you can see the stage it's in as so the first of those three steps. The next step then would be what we've got today, the Red Sea, where you can clearly see all of that basaltic material on the bottom of the ocean in that ridge. And then the mature ocean is the Atlantic with that very, very prominent mid-ocean uh, mid ridge there. If you wanted a local, more, a more local example in the sense of it being in Australia, there's a Devonian Rift Valley down the south coast of New South Wales in Eden in the Boyd Volcanics. Okay, so we're going to move now to our third misconception, which is that plates move because of convection in the mantle. It's like they're sitting on a conveyor belt. So this is a concept that we hear occasionally from students that we're going to address. So you might have seen pictures like this in textbooks where you've got a convection cell moving in the mantle and we've got the tectonic plates just sort of floating or drifting on top. And the term continental drift is very much in keeping with this idea that they're just drifting. If we look at the bottom right here, there's an experiment that we've also might have seen in textbooks where you've got a Bunsen burner creating convection in some water. And then the tectonic plate is represented by a, coke, a cork or something just floating mm -hmm. in the water. So it's not just uh, textbooks we see this, we also see this on some internet resources. And it's not just in old internet resources either. So here we have a example from a beautiful web page. It's multimedia resources. But again, we've got the same misconception of these convection currents in the mantle driving plate tectonics. So to help uh, remove this misconception, we're going to have a look at this map. So this is a map that's available for, three, for free download. We will make the link available in our resources when we give you those. And you might notice that on this map, we see the continents in gray. So this map looks a little bit strange if you're used to seeing the continents colored and the oceans as one solid color. So what this is showing us is, is the age of our oceanic crust. So our red colours, if we look at the scale at the bottom, although I know you can't read the numbers, the red is the really young crust and the blue or the cool colours is older crust. So again, we see our ridge lines where we're getting our crust formed. And then as we get further and further away from the ridge lines, we're getting crust that is older and colder until we get to this big blue zone over here. So what happens when we get this old, cold, crust. 
So we've got a diagram here that helps explain it using forces. So when we get this old cold crust, it's very dense compared to what's around it. And this is why our plates subduct. It's essentially driven by gravity. So our gravity pull force is represented by a little man here who's pulling that old cold dense oceanic crust back into the mantle. So we've got a video to show you a little analogy for this. I'm just going to click that so it starts loading. Uh, so this is an analogy for slab pull. So slab pull is the name we give for the process where we've got that old, cold, dense crust going back into the mantle. So in this video, you're going to see some paper clips which are representing our oceanic crust. So as they add more and more paper clips to their chain, you can imagine that as the oceanic crust being created at the ridges and being pushed along the tectonic plate until we get to our subduction zone. In this example, the edge of our box represents our subduction zone. So you see, to start off, we might have to push, but eventually the gravity of the paper clips or the slab in the real world, that old cold crust, it pulls the tectonic plate. And this is what drives our plate tectonic motions. So you see it again. Eventually it's that gravity pull on the plate that makes it move. So here's the diagram that shows the same concept. So we have our slab being pulled into the mantle. This is the major driving force. And we also have ridge push as well. So we do get a bit of a pushing force from those ridges where the new crust is being created. There we go, finally changed the slide. Okay, so again, if we're thinking about these forces, we can think of these gravity pull force down into the mantle working in conjunction with a lesser but still important ridge push force represented by the red people. So this process gives us essentially convection of the plates, but it is active convection. So the plates are getting old and cold and driving the convection. So they're very much part of the convection. So we can think of this as gravity driven convection rather than convection on which the plates are just floating on top of. Okay, so this leads us to our fourth and final misconception. When the plates collide, one goes under the other. And we've said, yeah, yeah, well, sometimes it does. So this is the video that Lara showed you before where you could see the oceanic crust being created at a ridge. And this here is an example of the type of rock that we would get from one of those ridges. So this is a basalt which we can think of as representing our oceanic crust. Our continental crust is mostly made of different kinds of rocks. And these are the rocks that you probably see more commonly because we live on the continents. So we've got our conglomerate here representing all our sedimentary rocks. We've got our granites and we've got a metamorphic gneiss as well. So our continental crust is made up of things that are not basalt. So you might be wondering why this matters. So in a moment, I'm going to step over to the other camera to show you an activity that we do often with year nine classes. And we're going to be looking at two different rocks in that activity. So we're going to see a sample of basalt and a sample of granite. So the basalt in this activity represents our oceanic crust and the granite represents the continental crust. So we think this is a great activity because it lets you link into other parts of science as well. So it lets you review density, what is density, mass divided by volume, talk about how you might measure it in a lab and then compare to how you might measure it or estimate it in the field. So I'm going to stop our share now so we can go over to the other camera. I'm literally going to run over there. Okay. So hopefully you can still see and hear me just fine. So I have here the rocks that we just discussed. I've got the basalt on my left hand. I've got the granite in my right hand. So for this activity, we generally get three volunteers from our student audience to come up and give this a go. And all we ask them to do is to hold one of the rocks in each hand. And the samples we give them are approximately the same volume. So we tell them because they're the same volume, we can work out which one is the most dense just by thinking about the mass or the weight of the two samples. So we generally get them to feel them like this, which one's heavier. We ask them to swap hands because sometimes just stronger dominant hand, things might feel lighter. 
And then we'll get all the students to vote on which one they think is the most dense or the least dense rock. Okay, I'm gonna nip back to our other camera. So I'm gonna bring our slides back up for one more time. Okay, so we then generally tell the students that they're not gonna be able to tell the exact densities of those rocks by doing that activity, but hopefully they can tell which one is most dense and which one is least dense. And again, if our slides want to play, there we go. So if we could measure it in a lab, we'd find out the granite is likely 2.7 grams per cc and the basalt about three. But generally the students can tell us that the granite feels less dense than the basalt. So this essentially means that our continental crust is buoyant. So this is a very strange thing to think about. It's odd to think of a rock as being buoyant but we're not comparing it to water. So we're not throwing it in the water and saying it's buoyant. We're comparing it to the other rocks around it. In this case, the oceanic crust. So me and Lara tried to come up with some good analogies for our continental crust. You can see some of our attempts here. We've got our giant rubber ducky as the continental crust and the water there is our oceanic. Or we've got our floating ice as well. So again, these things are less dense, so they are buoyant. Okay. Or another example we thought it's fun to think about is if you're in the pool and you've got a kickboard, it's very hard to get the kickboard to go beneath the water. And the same if you have a floaty or some pool noodles. So we're going to watch this video now together. So this guy's going to have four pool noodles that he's going to try to get to the bottom of the pool. So if you imagine this is the continental crust, it is buoyant. It sometimes can subduct, but it's very difficult to subduct continental crust because it is so buoyant. Sometimes it will go down a little bit, it will go down maybe 100 kilometres, but it tends to stay on the surface or return to the surface. So we'll just cut that off there. <laughs> okay, so why does this matter when we're talking about, uh, about plate boundaries? So what happens at a plate boundary depends on what kind of crust we have. So remember, Lara reminded you that our tectonic plates are not just crust. They're this lithospheric layer that is mostly lithospheric mantle, but there is this thin layer of crust on top. So in this example, this is probably closest to what our students are imagining where we've got this cold, dense oceanic crust subducting beneath some less dense continental crust. And you can see in this example, we might get some volcanoes being formed by this process. So we're not going to talk too much about volcanoes in this session. Our second session will be on hazards. So if you have any particular volcano questions, maybe send them through before the second session and we will address them then. Uh, but I think it's really exciting as well when you're talking to students about these to show not just these diagrams, but also the real world examples because some of the most beautiful, amazing landforms that we have on earth form at tectonic plate boundaries. So this here is one of the volcanoes in the Andes and it doesn't look particularly big there, but the volcano itself is almost six kilometers high. So this is a huge volcano. And as you can see, it is active, it erupts. Uh, and if you look in the bottom right-hand corner there, we have a uh, snapshot from our tectonic plates puzzle. So this is a resource we have in the education centre. If you're coming in with a school group anytime soon, you can pick up one of these. If you're not, that's fine because we've got a downloadable version available on our web page as well. So this is essentially a map of the world that you can cut up into the tectonic plates and you can see how they all fit together. So in this example here, you can see we've got our Nazca plate, which is our oceanic crust moving or subducting under our South American plate, which is the continental crust. Okay, and when we have two continental plates converge, let's have a look at what happens here. So we see, we do still get this lithospheric mantle subducting, and we might get some continental crust subducting at least some of the way, but a lot of the continental crust, like our pool noodles or like our giant rubber ducky, is not going to subduct very easily. And so instead it sort of gets scraped off and bumped together to form things like our mountain ranges. And again, we get some of these most amazing places. So here we have the Himalayas, which if we look at our plate, plates puzzle again, we will see that this is where we've got our Indo-Australian plate moving north into the Asian plate. And as this is a 
a continent on continent collision, we get the Himalayas being formed. So what about when we get to oceanic plates? So we said before that these are all going to be relatively dense. So this is all going to be basalt. But if you think back to the map that we saw showing us our age of the oceanic crust, and remember that we said that the older crust is also colder and more dense, whenever we get two oceanic crust meeting, one is always going to be older and colder than the other. And that's the one that's going to subduct. And we might get volcanoes forming, depending on where we are. But we also get some other interesting features as well. So this is an artist's impression of the Mariana Trench. So this is the deepest trench on Earth. It's just shy of 11 kilometers deep. So these are wonderful environments for students to think about as well. And there's also a good opportunity to incorporate some cross-curricular learning as well. Uh, because these trenches are so deep, after the first 300 meters, they are pitch black and they become very high pressure environments as well. So there's opportunities to talk about the animals that live in these environments and how they have adapted to survive. So you might be saying, but so far we've seen at least part of our tectonic plates subducting or going under another plate. We said that we don't always see that. So every example we've seen, at least the lithospheric mantle has gone under another plate. But here's some examples where we don't get that at all. So these are called transform boundaries. You might have seen a diagram like this one in textbooks where you've got two plates moving perfectly in opposite directions and just sort of grinding a little bit against each other. But often in the real world, it's not at these perfect angles. So if we have a look at the diagram on the left, we've got the Alpine Fault, which is responsible for a lot of New Zealand's earthquakes and volcanoes. And you see the plate movements, like they're not going directly into each other, but then also not going directly like our diagram of the strike, strike slip fault. So we've also got the San Andreas fault is also like this. So these faults can still cause a lot of earthquakes. And the San Andreas fault in particular has captured the imagination of Hollywood filmmakers with the creation of this movie, San Andreas, named after the fault itself. So I haven't actually seen this movie, so we're going to hand over to Lara now for a quick 10 second movie review. Well, it has the rock in it, which is appropriate for geology, so that in itself sells it. It's a very entertaining action flick, but the science is a little bit rubbish. Okay, thanks for that, Lara. So San Andreas is a movie that we might talk a little bit more about in our next session, which is more focused on hazards. But as you can see, we've got these big examples of colliding plates that aren't colliding directly enough for one to go under the other. So here's another resource that is available for you to download from our web page. So it's the topography of Australia, but it also shows the bathymetry of the surrounding ocean as well. So this can be a great resource for talking about plate tectonics and plate boundaries and colliding plates, as we can see some good examples of where mountains are formed in Papua New Guinea. We can see our Mariana Trench here as our really deep dark blue color because it's one of the deepest parts of the ocean. And we can also use it to talk about what happens in New Zealand where we get this plate boundary running halfway through the island. So we've, we'll just sum up here. So we've got our, our little students here talking about their misconceptions. So if we remember, it was we can't see the plates. And when they collide, one goes under the other. The mantle's made of liquid rock and the plates move because they're on a conveyor belt. But they've learned some things now. So now they know that the tectonic plates are the ground. And when plates collide, mountain tre mountains, trenches, and volcanoes are made. The mantle is actually more solid rock that moves very slowly. So that was our solid state movement. And then we've got plate tectonics being driven by slab pull and not by mantle convention, convection. OK, so in a moment, we are going to hand over to Ron. So we're going to ask you now if you have questions for Ron about plate tectonics to pop those in the chat now. We're going to run through some of the classroom resources to give you a bit of time to write, to write your questions down. Um, if you have to leave us for any reason before the end of the session, Lyra is also going to put the link to our SurveyMonkey survey in the chat now. We ask that you please do that on the way out. So that would be wonderful. 
but okay, we'll um, run through some classroom resources, but please do hit up our chat. So this is a pair of resources from our friends at Earth Learning Idea in the UK. So they, there are lots and lots of bits and pieces on their website that are all free, usually two page PDFs to download. But these two in particular are important and relevant to what we've spoken about today. So the first one on the left there is entitled What Drives the Plates? And this is nice because it allows you to have uh, volunteers to, to take part. So that picture there is teachers all arms linked uh, looking at slab pool and you can see the ocean ridge and subduction zones. So COVID permitting, that's a great uh, thing to do with students in the classroom. And the second one there we've highlighted is entitled, all models are wrong, but some are really wrong. And that's again, emphasizing what we were talking about today. So they're, they're both very highly recommended. There we go. This is from the Geological Society in the UK. Now uh, it's a little quiz. It's a great way for you to be able to test what your students know, perhaps prior to starting a unit on plate tectonics. We can't leave you without, again, spruiking our resources. So we've already talked about two of these, um, the, the second and the fourth ones. But the top one there is another colleague from our team talking about plate tectonics, a five minute video on our YouTube channel. And the third one there is a, a cutout where you can make the earth on a tennis ball and look at what happened. Sorry, I've just seen chat coming up and it's just distracted me for a second. There are lots and lots of resources on our website, so please go and visit there at that link at the bottom. There's also this wonderful video, it goes for about 30 minutes with Chris Folks talking about plate tectonics. It is a publicly accessible video and was actually made for scientists at GA who aren't familiar with all these bits and pieces. Uh, and it's wonderful, it's, all, it's one of a whole series of 101 videos that were made a few years ago. And again, it's on, on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. Okay, thanks for that, Lara. Okay, so we're going to hand over to Dr. Ron now. So we've got Dr. Ron Hatley. He's our Acting Director of Onshore Seismic. Oh, no, not going to say that word. Ron, can you say that word? <laughs> Chicken Louise. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Ron. You, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, good. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Ron. Um, I'll say that word for Louise. It's I'm the director at the moment of the onshore seismic and magnetotellurics section here at Geoscience Australia. Um, magnetotellurics, since you may be curious now, is about measuring, making measurements of the Earth's magnetic field and the electric field um, and how those fields, I guess, conduct down into the Earth's uh, crust and lithosphere. And um, we can use that to say something about the properties of the, uh, of the Earth's interior. Um, I guess just by way of introduction, um, I, I think this presentation you've heard today about you new know, plate tectonics, the tectonic plates, you know, it's, it's really fundamental to all the geoscience that any of us do. Um, and going way back to when I was an honours student at uh, the Australian National University, even though we won't say how long ago, um, you know, I was working on a project with a, a big, huge tank of glucose syrup. And uh, some of that was diluted a bit with water. And then there, were, there was other bits put in which were more dense. And that was modeling that whole process of the, uh, of the plates being pulled down into the mantle and driving the circulation. Uh, but just about everything else I've done in the, in the time as a, as a geoscientist, almost 30 years as a geoscientist, there you go, I've given it away now. Um, you know, plate tectonics is reflected in it. You can see a couple of pictures there on the left. It's making some measurements of the Earth's gravity field with a, with a box there. Um, in the Hammersley Ranges in, uh, in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Um, that's the region where a lot of our um, iron ore, well, all of our, well, the vast, vast majority of our iron ore comes from that goes into making steel. Um, and even though those rocks there are around about two and a half billion years old, some of the tectonic processes looked very similar to what was happening today. And there used to be a big mountain range there. So the kind of situation that, uh, that Louise and Lara talked about, you know, the, the two continental plates colliding, one not quite wanting to go down and you're making mountains instead. Um, and the other picture there is from the time in Antarctica, I'm the one hanging over the edge doing safety training for going out, uh, doing some measurements underneath the Antarctic ice cap. Again, looking at the geology underneath the ice cap and how plate tectonics has shaped some of the mountain ranges and things that, that form in Antarctica. Um, so yeah, plate tectonics is fundamental to everything and, and some of the other concepts you've, you've seen there as well, like the decompression melting. Um, Mount St Helens is one of the, my first memories of being interested in geoscience uh, in 1980, I think that was, wasn't it? 
And um, yeah, just seeing those videos of, of the side falling off the volcano and then all the pressure released and the, the lava exploding out. Um, so yeah, hopefully that um, gives you, I guess, a, a, a concept of how plate tectonics is, is important. And these days at, in my job at Geoscience Australia, we're doing a lot of work looking at how plate tectonics is shaped where mineral deposits form. Um, you, know, you saw that the pictures of uh, the mid-ocean ridge spreading and ultimately forming the ocean basins and on the edges of those ocean basins are sedimentary deposits, which also host our oil and gas and can potentially store carbon dioxide. So those tectonic processes are, are everywhere. And I guess that's what makes the Earth unique from all the, the especially the solid planets in the solar system. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, the idea is to answer a few questions now, right, Louise and Lara? Yeah, that's correct. So we got one here from yeah. Sonia Taylor. I'm wondering what you're going to make of this one exactly. She's asking, is the Mars bar prac worth the effort when explaining tectonic plate movement for year 10? Would you use a Mars bar as a good analogy? Um, I, I did see that then. I was thinking about that. I'm not completely uh, familiar with the experiment, but if I think of a Mars bar and I was thinking of uh, explaining a tectonic plate or the lithosphere, I'd probably actually flip the Mars bar upside down. So the caramelly bit would be underneath and it would have the same thickness as the nougat, you know, the, the, the soft floaty stuff. And then I would think of that as a, tec as a tectonic plate. So the, um, the, you know, the, the nougat part is sort of, I guess, a little bit more brittle. If you bent that, it would start to crack and break, which the, the crust would kind of do. Um, and the caramelly bit underneath is the bit that stretches out and, um, and uh, you know, deforms and, and flows a bit more than, which would be like the, the lithospheric mantle. So the lower part of the tectonic plate. And then I guess if you think of that, that Mars bar, that inverted Mars bar, change the proportions a bit. And you think of that being subducted down, it would be bent. Um, and that upper part, the crust, would actually probably start to crack a little bit. Um, and we do see in some of the subduction zones, there are, there are faults form where the plate is being bent and going underneath uh, the other one. So yes, I think the Mars bar is, is a pretty reasonable representation of, the, um, of, the, of a tectonic plate uh, with the caveat that maybe you'd, you'd flip it over. Okay, Actually, thank you very thank you. much. It's great. Okay, we got another question here. We showed the map at the age of the oceanic crust. So how do we know the ages of these rocks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting question, that one, because um, you know, I guess the ultimate way we can work out the age of a rock is to collect a sample of it. Um, and then we can use these, these dating techniques where we use the decay of radioactive elements to work out you know, the relative proportions of those, those different isotopes. Um, and from that proportion, we can work out the age of the rock. Um, but I guess you can imagine that, that mapping, you know, collecting samples of the ocean floor all over the world, all over the world's oceans would be you know, pretty much an unrealistic task. But it so happens, um, I, I'm not sure that, I think that would be familiar to some of you that um, you know, when, these, when, these, uh, when you get the magma coming up into the mid-ocean ridge, it cools, that magma has magnetic minerals in it, and those magnetic minerals tend to line up with the Earth's magnetic field at the time. Um, and we also know that the Earth's magnetic field is flipped over from time to time um, on periods of tens of thousands of years or millions of years. Um, so if we, if we know the age of a rock at a particular time, we'll know it's some um, particular magnetic characteristics from the, the time that that lava formed. And we can actually go around and map the magnetic field of the rocks on the ocean floor. And from that, we can extrapolate the ages away from where we've got the samples. Um, and that's one of the, the I guess, the, the first things that really, really sort of hit the nail on the head sort of in that, in that developing that plate tectonic theory that we were able to map the magnetic field of the oceans and see that it was uh, of the ocean rocks and see that it was symmetric on each side of those mid-ocean ridges um, and that's what helped us then uh, work out the age of uh, age of all the, the seafloor and produce those maps those global maps of the ocean age fantastic i love that idea of our oceanic crust kind of like being a big tape recorder as it goes along yep. Yep. And we got a question here as well what's the difference between a fault and a plate boundary or how would you maybe explain that to students yeah, so I, I guess in a way, a, a, a plate boundary is a fault. It's a it's a mega fault. So you know, a, a fault is I guess a, a weakness or a fracture in the uh, in in the crust or the lithosphere um, where things can move past each other. So like I said, the, the, the tectonic plate boundaries are essentially mega faults. They are faults because you know um, different you know, blocks of lithosphere move past each other with one subducting going past sideways past each other. Um, 
but as part of that process, you know, I guess the whole plate tectonic process with plates moving around, it induces a lot of stress in the Earth's crust and in the Earth's mantle. Um, so the, the, lithos the, the lithosphere itself, the lower parts, the mantle lithosphere probably behave more ductilely, so it deforms and flows, but the crust tends to be more brittle. So if you have stresses of plates colliding, you get mountain belts forming, and um, you know, it's, it's not just the, fault, the, the mountains forming by folding rocks, you're also getting um, faults where bits of the mountains get pushed up over the other bits. Um, so the Andes have lots of volcanoes that make up the, the high topography there, but a lot of it is about the movements of the crust as it's being deformed and squished on those faults. So a fault can be um, you know, any scale. We can, we can look at, you know, I, I guess, some of the earthquakes that happen in Australia. Um, you know, they're very small, but they can actually have small faults as, as well. So we can have little offsets in the ground of maybe 10, 20 centimetres. Um, and I'm sure there's some, some places on our website where I, I couldn't put my finger on one now, where we can see some of those tiny little faults uh, of, from earthquakes in Australia, even though the middle of Australia is a long way from an, a, a, a plate boundary, but all of those stresses build up in the continent and you get fractures and breaks and small little earthquakes as well. Hope Excellent. that answers that question. Thank you very much. We've also got a question here about the rate that the plates move. The question is, we often teach that the rates move about as fast as your fingernail grows. How accurate is that? How accurate is that estimate? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think we know the, the, the speed or the velocity at which the plates move pretty accurately. Um, we, we can, these days, especially now that we've got you know, the, the GPS, the satellite positioning systems, we can set up permanent GPS uh, receivers all around the um, all around the planet, all over the tectonic plates. Obviously, not on the ocean floor because we wouldn't get any signal on the ocean floor. Um, but on islands and things, you know, in in Hawaii, we could put some a GPS receiver, and it would be this, essentially the same technology as the GPS receiver in your phone, just obviously much more sophisticated and more sensitive. And we can there is in in many parts of the world now, you know, very dense networks of these GPS receivers. Uh, in New Zealand, in Japan, for example, where they have a lot of uh, issues with earthquakes, um, there are very dense networks where they can really map out even you know, the, the, the deformation of the continent as those plates are, are colliding and moving past each other. Um, so yeah, those, those, those velocities that we, we, we can actually really measure those velocities now of the, uh, of the tectonic plates. In, in the past, before GPS, it would have been a little bit about modeling, you know, knowing something about the, the, you know, the, the rocks, the age of the rocks, how long it took you know, for those rocks to form and, and move from one side of, a, of the plate or from the mid-ocean ridge to the subduction zone. And there would be models of how those plates were reconstructed over time. And of course, those models got better and better as we were able to constrain the velocities with, um, with GPS measurements. Great, so we've got a question that probably links pretty strongly to one of the misconceptions we've talked about. And that question is, if, is some of the mantle actually liquid so that it can then flow as lava? Um, I think the, the short answer is yes, and the and the example that you you both talked about earlier was at the mid ocean ridges. Um, so the, the mantle has a particular composition um, when it's flowing as part of that uh, gravity driven convection flow. It, it is behaving you know as a as a solid like a glacier. Um, but if you start to change the um, you know the the, the the pressure and the temperature. So the one that was the example that was talked about was you know as as the as the um, tectonic plates move apart at the mid ocean ridge you're unloading you're taking pressure off those rocks below um, and once that pressure reduces they can start to melt and when they melt then you have the lava which is liquid um, we generally talk about uh, I guess in, in in that sort of sense um, partial melting often it's it's not the whole rock that melts it's just parts of it that melt. And that part that's melted is extracted away, and because it's 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 melted and less dense, it will be the the part of the rock that floats um, that um, I guess migrates to the surface and, and erupts at the mid ocean ridge. Um, but we can have there, there can be other reasons why we can we can melt the um, melt the mantle. Um, one of those was shown, I think, in some of the diagrams of the, the volcanoes above the um, above the subduction zone. Um, and what happens there is this, as the subducting plate comes down underneath. Um, there's a lot of water in the sediments that form on top of the, um, the, the well, let's go back a step. There's, you know, we have the basalt crust of the oceanic plates. And generally on top of that, we have a lot of sediment. And a lot of that sediment has a lot of water in it. So when we subduct the plate, the water of course gets sort of squeezed out of those sediments and it migrates into the bits of the mantle that are up above the tectonic plate. 
and that also changes the um, I guess the physical properties of those rocks and it influences the temperature and that process can start to induce the melting as well and you can get, then get the, the liquid components of the mantle that then migrates up into those volcanoes. Um, you might touch on more of that in the next session um, but there are certainly processes you can melt um, parts of the mantle. I don't think you could ever melt the whole mantle. Um, there are also uh, that's maybe a slightly different story, but you know that the, some of you may be familiar with the mantle plumes, these plumes of rock which come from right near the, the boundary between the core and the mantle. And they come up in places like Hawaii, the hot spot of Hawaii. And that's melted rock that's come up in a sort of a, a balloon or a plume, plume that's come up from very deep and, and, and up to the surface. Right, then we've got a question here as well. We're not entirely sure what the question is, but are you aware of any misconceptions about the plates surrounding mafic and felsic elements or mafic and felsic rocks, I guess? Are you aware of any a common misunderstanding or misconception about that? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I, I guess if we're, I'll, I'll try and I'll step through it a bit as I'm thinking as well. Um, when we're thinking of the mafic rocks, we're thinking of the basalts. Um, and when we're thinking of the felsic rocks, we're thinking uh, something to do with, the, I guess, the granites. And I guess the, the oceanic crust tends to be more mafic because it's dominated by the basalts. And the, uh, the, 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 the continental crust tends to be more felsic because it's dominated by things like granite. And um, in, in terms of misconceptions, um, I, I'm struggling to think of something off the top of my head, but um, you know, one little story we can throw in there maybe is that um, ultimately those those mafic rocks and those felsic rocks all come from the same the same kind of source. So if you think of the mantle, when the mantle was originally there before plate tectonics had started, and there's a big debate about when plate tectonics did start, but it could have been billions of years ago, the mantle had a chemical composition. Um, at those mid-ocean ridges when things started, you melted some of the rock and you extracted out the components of that mantle that were more readily melted. And when you extract that out, the first thing you get is basalt. Um, and so I, I don't know, some of you might've heard mantle composition is kind of like a peridotite rock. Some of those bright green ones, um, I don't know if you've got one there, you can hold up quickly, Louise or Lara, but these green rocks, peridotite, if you melt them, you get basalt. If you keep melting basalt, or um, you can start to extract the more felsic components, so the, the lighter stuff. And that's, you know, a lot of that happens at these subduction zones. So you've got the basalt crust melting, the water coming off the slab, you're melting the mantle, you're extracting the felsic, the more granitic kind of melts, and then they what sort of accumulate and build up the, um, build up the continents. Um, so framing that in terms of a misconception, I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, I, I guess the, the message I'm trying to share here is that you know, all of those rocks start out essentially with the same, the same silicate mantle, which was mentioned in, in that uh, pie diagram of the shape of, or the, of the layers in the, uh, in the earth. Okay, wonderful. If, you, if you want to reframe that question as you think based on the answer, then yeah, put, a, put, some, put a, an, ex, an addition to that and we can have another go. Okay, so we have another question here. This is sort of related to what you were saying before about the changes in the magnetic field over time. And we've got someone asking, what causes the magnetic switching? Yeah, okay. Um, that's a good question as well. So the Earth's magnetic field, um, we can think of it as a combination of, of several things. Um, there's the, the total magnetism of, of, of the Earth is, is, is a sum of the, um, the magnetic field that comes from the core and it comes from the outer part of the core. And the outer part of the core is actually thought to be a liquid. It's a very different composition to the mantle. The mantle's, you know, that silicate rock but the outer core is iron and nickel. Um, and it so happens to be that it's, it's liquid. And we're pretty confident that it's liquid because um, when we look at a lot of the shape, the, the layers of the earth are defined by the seismic waves that travel through them from earthquakes. Um, and there's the two types of waves, the compressional waves, where the particles are sort of you know, wobbling like this. And there's the shear waves where the particles are sort of wobbled past each other. And shear waves can't travel through liquid um, so the outer core is pretty convincingly liquid because the shear waves, there's no evidence of shear, these shear waves from earthquakes um, propagating through the outer core. Um, so hold on to that one. The other parts of the Earth's magnetic field are the, is, is the magnetization of the rocks at the Earth's surface. So the, the crustal rocks, basalt, all those uh, rocks have magnetic minerals in them. So there's a component of that. 
And then another part of the Earth's magnetic field is the solar, the solar radiation, the solar wind interacting with the Earth's atmosphere and causing all sorts of dynamic magnetic fields in, in the atmosphere. But the switch of the Earth's magnetic field is dominated by what's happening in the core. And it's a kind of a, it is a convective sort of a process as well. Um, and when you think of um, uh, electric currents flowing, um, you know, this, this, this iron is conductive, electric currents flow, they cause magnetic fields. So that's where the Earth's magnetic field comes from. Um, but every now and then that, that, um, that flow in the core is kind of chaotic. And every now and then it kind of just completely switches over. Um, and then the Earth's mag magnetic field becomes the opposite. So the, the, Earth's, the switch in the magnetic field is largely a result of the, um, you know, I guess, the chaotic flow in the, uh, in the Earth's outer core, that liquid part of the outer core. Okay, thank you so much, Ron. So we do have some additional questions in the chat that are more about teaching materials, which we won't flick to Ron, but we will try and when we send out our list of classroom resources, we'll try and address some of your questions about best rocks and minerals for senior students. And if we have any recommendations to shake a table, we'll try and address that in the materials that we send out as well. But massive thank you to you, Dr. Ron. Really appreciate you coming along to answer My all pleasure. those tricky questions. Okay, so we will be wrapping up in just a moment. If I can get our slides to wake up. Okay, so we're very, very thankful to you all for joining us today. Uh, again, if you have a chance to complete our survey on the way out, Lara will pop that in the chat again. So that's sitting there nice and fresh for you. And just a reminder that we are back at the same time next week for some more platonic misconceptions. And this time we'll be focusing more on hazards. And once again, we're happy to address any particular questions you may have if you send them through to us before the session. Okay, so thank you all to attending and thank you to Dr. Rob for being our resident scientist and we'll catch you all next week.